Production funding for Flying Squirrels Insider is made possible in part by... Clean water is one of our most valuable resources. Conserving it should be all of our responsibility. Remember every day to make every drop count. Wash full loads, take shorter showers, turn off your faucet. Water. Use it wisely. Let's commit to conserve. This week, Flying Squirrels Insider comes to you straight from Funville to break down all the action on the field. Find out how starting pitchers stay in the game and help their team on the off days, even without putting on a uniform. Also, we check out Tebow Mania when the squirrels visit the Rumble Ponies. Plus, pitching coach Glenn Dishman stops by to talk about his major league time and how he has brought that experience to coach the Flying Squirrels. Now, here are your hosts, Sam Ravitch and Jay Burnham. We brought this show on the road. FSI from the Diamond, Jay and Sam with you. A whole lot happening for the Flying Squirrels, and we'll break that down in just a moment. But first, we'd like to thank our friends here at FSI from Utility Buddy from the City of Richmond Department of Public Utilities. And we happen to leave him back at the studio. Hi, Utility Buddy. It makes us aware of rain that falls on hard surface areas. It can pick up pollutants and carry them to Richmond's waterways without being treated. Also, if you want to win free stuff, as always, you can text us. Text FSI. To 63975. Message and data rates may apply. Mobile services provided by Opt in Technologies. With that said, I'll bring in my broadcast partner, Sam Ravitch. And Sam, although it was a good, not great month of May for the Flying Squirrels, this team's still in second place in the West. Yeah, still in second place. And I think it's going to be between them and Akron when it comes down uh, towards the end of the season. Uh, but look, uh, the month of May wasn't great. They started off really hot. Uh, you're not going to have six, seven game winning streaks throughout the course of a season, um, but you'd like to see them start to put together a little bit more consistency uh, in the month of June. We've talked a lot about the pitching on the first couple of the shows this year. Today we're going to talk about the offense, but first, maybe it was a little bit tough to get going in that month of May because of all the rain that we had. Yeah, we had so much rain. I mean, we were here, we had back-to-back -back rain outs. It was just a disaster, and you can't really get anything going momentum-wise. And when you have a pitcher who's scheduled to pitch on a Wednesday and doesn't get in on until Saturday, it just, you know, it messes the whole rotation up and the rhythm of the team. So it, it's kind of tough to, to kind of come back from that. It's a game of routines. And it that is. certainly breaks up the routine. The good news about rain, de rain delays and rain outs is that we've got double headers coming up and the Flying Squirrels will make up one of those rain outs on June the 9th, Saturday against the Nationals affiliate. All right, we're talking about the offense. One guy that has been in lockstep since he got here to the double-A level is Ryan Howard. He continues to impress for Richmond. Yeah, Ryan Howard is one of the more consistent players that you'll see on this Flying Squirrels team. And he even said during an interview earlier on this season, he said, look, I want manager Willie Harris and everybody in the Giants system to know what they're going to get when I go out there to play shortstop. They're going to get solid defense. They're going to get a couple of base hits each game. So he kind of he really emphasizes that consistency as a big part of his game and why he's successful. Yeah, one of the guys that I sort of have equated him to, albeit a bit older when he was here, is Christian Arroyo, who really was able to hit doubles, find the gaps, and then having those home run hitters, uh, home run power coming a little bit later on in his career. But certainly a guy that can certainly get it done at this level. All right, guys that maybe struggled a year ago and then having much more success this season include Dylan Davis, and the name of the game is getting better, and that's what Davis has been able to do. He has been able to do that. Dylan Davis is a guy last year who struck out 100 times in 99 games, and now he comes in here, and he's making more contact, and we've talked about it at nauseum during our broadcast, how he's able to use that other side of the field and push the ball the other way out to right field with a couple of doubles. He's had the extra base hits this year, leads the team in RBIs, so it's really good to see Dylan Davis, and it's amazing what a difference a year can make for a guy. A guy guy that really, I think, has much better pitch selection at the plate. He's been anchoring the lineup for the Richmond Flying Squirrels and manager Willie Harris. You can see there uh, 17 extra base hits, had 27 all of last season. And let's not forget, this is a guy that was a third round selection for the San Francisco Giants. I mean, a lot of expectations for him. And then I think his prospect status might have taken a step back due to the lackluster season he had a year ago, but certainly putting himself back into that conversation this year. Yeah, I think so. And I think, honestly, it might have given him a wake-up call saying, hey, listen, we got to start playing the way we were playing towards the end of our college 
college years and in the lower parts of the Giants system. I think Dylan Davis has what it takes to get to the next level. Uh, I think we've seen it on display, certainly in spurts here, and we've seen his plate appearances and his plate discipline get a lot better. And I think just by doing that and waiting for his pitch, he's getting more and better pitches to see, which is the reason for all these extra base hits and home runs. Also getting better, we talked about him on the last show, Corey Taylor for the Richmond Flying Squirrels. Kit Taylor was the opening day starter for this team. Seven wins so far this season, but just across the board, the numbers have been much better for him this year. Yeah, they really have, and I think for Corey Taylor, it's, it's a couple of reasons why we're seeing him a, a lot better in the wins column. One, he's getting some more offense behind him. He didn't really have all of that last year. He's getting better defense behind him as well. Sometimes the defense, I know the team led the uh, league in errors in the month of April last year, that, so it's tough to get off and dig yourself a hole and try to dig out of it. Um, but when you start out on top, and, and Corey Taylor with those seven wins, now second place in the Eastern League with those seven wins, it, it just has to feel a lot better, and you feel more confidence on the mound when you have all those other elements around you to help you pitch better. You know, believe it or not, we're about 50-plus games into the season by the time you guys are watching this on WCVE and our Community Idea Station affiliates. And the Squirrels could have Taylor as a potential all-star, Jordan Johnson in the starting rotation, and Sean Anderson. I mean, you're looking at maybe three starting pitchers in that all-star game. Yeah, Jay, I mean, we were talking about it too. I think this is one of the more dominant and formidable rotations throughout the entire Eastern League, never mind the Western Division. I think that one, two, three punch at the top with Corey Taylor, Sean Anderson, and Jordan Johnson, as you said, these are guys that could easily pitch at the next level right now if there was room. Obviously, there's not a lot of room up there at Sacramento right now. Back to the offense, I thought one of the unique things, and I think you pointed this out first in one of our broadcasts, was the Flying Squirrels have actually been able to outscore their opponents dramatically, drastically in the fifth inning. And there may or may not be a reason for that, don't you think? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's just an anomaly, but it's funny when you look at the run differentials in the third, fourth, and sixth, and seventh innings, the, the flying squirrels are actually in the minus column pretty high. But in the fifth inning, for whatever reason, they have like a plus 25 run differential, meaning they have outscored their opponents by 25 runs in the fifth inning of games so far this season. It's, it is remarkable, and I think it's an outlier. You know, talking to guys like Francisco Morales, Flying Squirrels hitting coach, Willie Harris, the Flying Squirrels manager, saying maybe there's something to that when you see a starting pitcher the third time through the order. Guys are making adjustments, and so the Squirrels do have hitters that are at the 200 level and batting average and below, but they're able to sort of adapt to what the uh, opposition is giving them and then having success that third time through. Yeah, I think you have to credit Francisco Morales, the hitting coach, for that as well because you have to make changes on the fly. And when he's able to look out there, see what a pitcher is doing, see how he's throwing guys at the plate. And I mean, look, guys at the plate don't always necessarily pick up on that stuff because you're focused on just trying to get on base at that point. So it's it's Morales' job to really focus in on the pitcher and see what he's doing to the batters and then make adjustments. Squirrels Getting back Miguel Gomez, he had his first home run of the season on this homestand for the Flying Squirrels, drilled the ball over the right field wall. This is a guy that went right from Richmond to San Francisco last year. He did so again this season. I know it's tough for a guy to come back from the major leagues to this level, but certainly was able to fill in nicely for the Giants. Yeah, he certainly was. And, you know, it was great to see him get up there and put back on the Giants jersey now for the second year uh, in a row. But for Gomez to come back here and work on a couple of things, one, he's really gonna he's gonna help this offense out big time, and two, he's he's a guy that likes to work hard. I mean, we saw him here uh, yesterday, a couple days ago, when he arrived back from the Giants organization up in the big leagues. He was out in center field running, getting work in. So he really wants to get back up there, and I think if he plays well here, he's gonna have another chance. And that goes for all the guys on the 40-man roster. They are just one call away from the major leagues. Chase Johnson, Aramis Garcia, flying squirrels catchers, the other catcher, the other two uh, that are on the Giants 40-man. But it goes to show just how close guys are to being big leaguers from this level. Yeah, you're a call away. I mean, we've saw, we've seen it all over the place where you have DJ Snelton and other guys uh, that, that'll get called up uh, by, the, by the phone of a call, and, and it's just, that's kind of the way it happens. It's baseball, and um, Garcia is just that one phone call away. It's baseball, it's TV and the elements, right, my friend? Well, this is what happens when you bring a show outside. You know, you have to run the elements with that. <laughs> all right, thanks a lot. It's going to be a great season going forward for the Flying Squirrels. In second place, as we mentioned, in the Western Division, we've got more to come on Flying Squirrels. Squirrels Insider. Squirrel versus Squirrel, the intellectual edition. Trivia, I've got Dan Slania and Nutsy. Gentlemen, are you ready for the first question? Let's do it. Okay. Joe DiMaggio's famous 56-game hitting streak came to an end on what date? This is Joe Panic of the San Francisco Giants. Have fun. 
go nuts. Sorry? Come again. Dan for the steal. July 17th, 1941. Ding, 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 ding. Slaney, round one. This formula describes for any right angle triangle the square of the length of the hypotenuse. Not C. This is Joe Panic. This is Joe Panic. Dan for the steal. The Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem is the answer. Slacking today, big guy. All right. Final question for the win. This rodent like mammal has a special membrane between their front and back legs that allow them to glide. You should know this one thumbs, fingers, body. Uh, I can't. I can't accept that. Dan for the. It's the flying squirrel. The flying squirrel is the correct answer. Dan Slania is your squirrel versus squirrel winner. Greetings from Binghamton, New York. In 2014, renowned author John Feinstein wrote a nonfiction entitled Where Nobody Knows Your Name, an inside look at minor league baseball. Some of the cold hard facts for minor league baseball players are that they don't have a ton of name recognition. That is, of course, until they get to the major leagues. That anonymity allows quite a bit of access for fans and allows fans to get to know players, coaches, and staffs over the course of a season. And it's one of the reasons why minor league baseball has been so successful over the past three decades. Decades. But what happens when you take a land where nobody knows your name and you insert one of the biggest names in professional sports? Well, those two intersect here at NYSEC Stadium with Tim Tebow, a.k.a. Tebow Time, Tebow Mania, sweeping the Eastern League by storm. New owner, upgraded stadium, rebranded team, a playoff team, and now one of the most popular players in all of baseball here in Binghamton. You'll have major league rehabbers, you'll have top prospects, and they get some attention. But there's just a different level when you're with Tebow, and that uh, grown men are, are like calling his name for autographs or to get a helmet signed, or they're wearing his jersey. And there's just there's just more people, sheer volume, uh, more people that are specifically at this game to see Tim Tebow. And they probably, a lot of them, aren't even baseball fans. They're just there to follow Tim Tebow. The pitch. Swing a high fly ball, deep right, forget it. Are you kidding me? A three-run blast by Tim Tebow in his first double-A plate appearance. The Rumble Ponies take a 5-0 lead. So it all happens in the first inning. Peter Alonso hits a two-run homer, a couple of walks by Portland starter, and now lo and behold, here comes Tim Tebow with two outs, two guys on base. Ballpark's got more than 4,000 people in it, somewhere near 5,000. And all their eyes are on Tebow. And after all that anticipation, after having a couple of weeks of speculation, if he'd be here or not, he's here. And he sends the first pitch. I mean, it was a no doubt. He, he, he killed it. So that was, it was a fun moment, a great moment. Uh, it's fun to hear a ballpark sound like it would for any regular game, not just opening day. But uh, it was special, and he's just got a flair for the dramatic. That's how it works with him. Kicks and throws. Popped up, shallow left field, tailing. Tim Tebow sprints over. Tebow dives and catches. We had him here in Columbia for 40 games. He spent the entire first half with us, traveled, and you know there were ballparks across our league that had some of their biggest crowds, not only of the season, but also in some cases, the biggest crowds they've had in their franchise's history. He was fantastic. I mean, he, he, all the things you read about him or see about him in the news and in the tabloids and stuff, you know, his, his personality is as genuine as they come. Uh, he's a great leader in our clubhouse, great guy to have on the field, and, you know, certainly did, did his part along with the rest of our team to be part of our community. His private persona with the, with the team and with us and, and the traveling party is what you get in the public persona. There's no, there's no Tim Tebow in public and Tim Tebow in private. He's the same guy in both sides. Now, was that the question? Yes, let's go. I'm getting to know you guys too well right now, man. We gotta change it up a little bit. <laughs> I know this sounds ridiculous, but it just, he just kind of fits in. Like you don't really even realize until you get to a stadium that Tim Tebow is in your traveling party. And I think the, the strangest part of the whole season has just been having a front row seat to what it is to be a celebrity. 
and Tim's handled it with class and ease. I mean, he admits he's been doing this since his middle teens with the attention like this. So he understands what it's like to be in the spotlight. A game tying three run blast by Tim Tebow. Deep over the wall in right center. And we start anew in the sixth. It is 5 5. One, I'm loving what I'm doing. Two, um, I believe in myself and what we're doing, and I think um, three, I've seen the results when I do it right. I think all of those things are encouraging um, now that I think certain things I definitely want to be more consistent at. Um, but I think all of that, starting with number one, I'm just enjoying it every day and loving it. And uh, whether that's BP, whether I was in here early today, all the things, like that's, you know, you got to love what you do, and I do that. Now the Rumble Ponies fans realizing who is striding to the plate. Four home runs. And 18 runs driven in. Tebow, warm round of applause. Taylor's 1-1. Pulled over first into right. That's a base hit. Long turn second. He'll look for third. Thrown in by Rodriguez. And it's grabbed and held by Ryan Howard. Tim Tebow with a hard hit smash. Pulls a single into right field. We're here at the bullpen bar with a man that knows a thing or two about the bullpen, Flying Squirrels pitching coach Glenn Dishman. And uh, Dish, thanks for taking the time today. Wonderful. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're going to talk about your pitching staff, all right? And it seems to be a solid pitching staff at the outset. Just give me an overall sort of feeling as to how the season's gone so far for you guys. I'm uh, really delighted. Uh, we came into the summer uh, knowing that we had a decent staff and, and the guys have, have really gelled. Uh, we've had some guys go to AAA that are doing a good job up there. Uh, but as an overall staff, these kids are growing um, and getting better every day. We, we've had some hiccups here in the last couple of weeks, giving up some runs, uh, falling behind in some counts. But yeah. uh, they're battling. They're working hard. A uh, great group of kids that are very coachable. So it's, it's fun. Let's talk about those guys. You know, we've been ta talking about Corey Taylor on the broadcast now for two seasons. It really feels as though he's taken uh, the next step in his journey, doesn't it? Fair to say? Yeah, he's, uh, you know, I know he used to throw harder last year. And, uh, you know, maybe his command wasn't as good. But this year he's, he's kind of really honing it in. Uh, doing some mechanical changes that have gotten his sinker to where it really needs to be. His breaking ball sharp. Uh, we've changed the, to, the, you know, the angle on it just a little bit to get some more swings and misses. And maybe his last four or five outings have been really solid. A guy that, when he's in the zone, can certainly be effective. And you've got one guy that's been effective since day one, and that's Sean Anderson. I know a lot of Giants fans are eager to see <laughs> what he can do. What has been your impression of uh, him so far? Uh, we call him Thor 2. Thor 2, yeah, he's got the look, <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, he's just a beast. Yeah. He's he's that, that prodigy that you, you look at, and, I mean, the intangibles that he brings to the mound, the worth ethic. Uh, I mean, just this, he's a student of the game. I send him the advanced reports, and he studies them. Uh, works his tail off and he's a guy that you know he's not a 97 100 mile an hour guy but his ball plays harder than it, than it looks he's upper 90s or, you know it plays to upper 90s but he's sitting 93 95 and yeah. with a good curveball and slider and he's a guy that's still learning how to pitch because he was really just a reliever in college right yeah you know he, the, with that bulldog mentality he has yeah. uh, he, he does come out you know that first inning he's usually fired up and ready to go uh, so we're working on honing that down a little bit but yeah that closer mentality comes Comes out a lot in him. The other kind of top of the rotation guy that's really had a solid start to the season is Jordan Johnson. What's what's made him so effective this year? Uh, I, I, I see a different look in him. Um, I know he was here last year a little bit, and you know he's really taken to some mechanical changes that we've made over uh, during spring training over the summer. Um, he's got you know he's another guy that has a fastball that plays harder than it uh, looks. You know he's hitting spots. He's being able to get the ball to his glove side. Uh, throws a, a changeup that's actually hard. It's 88, 89 miles an hour, and he gets a ton of swings and misses on it. Now, those that don't, don't know, you had a major league playing career as well. <laughs> Came up with the San Diego, San, San Diego Padres, correct? Yes, sir. And Bruce Bochy was your manager your first year, Bruce, wasn't he? Bruce Bochy was my manager, and, and as we were walking up, I was telling you the story that he caught my first bullpen in big league camps. So as the manager. As the manager, so. <laughs> no pressure, Glenn, right? Uh, no, and I was making sure I never threw a ball in the dirt whatsoever, so and it was hard to watch him get down into a squat with those knees, but he, he, he battled it out, and, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> And do you still stay in touch with Boach, obviously, now being back with the Giants? System? Really only during spring training. Right. Um, you know, the, the other manager, that my first manager ever was Tim Flannery. So that was really cool to, to be with him, too. So, But Boach, you know, I only see him really during spring training and hopefully uh, maybe sometime soon in San Francisco. Let's hope. 
You've got a couple new arms out of the bullpen. Ray Black has been bump up, bumped up to AAA. Patrick Rutolo has sort of taken over a lead role there, along with the Richmond native Connor Overton. Can you give us an overview on those two guys? Uh, Rutolo, he's, uh, he's, he's another guy. I love his personality. I love his fire and his drive. He's a Boston guy, you know, so he's got that tough northeastern, you know, kind of mentality. He comes in. He's throwing 93, 94. Uh, you know, normally a guy that just, paints the outside corner with a, a curveball that is, uh, as they would call it, wicked, you know, wicked curveball. And then uh, he's developing a little changeup that, uh, you know, jokingly, he calls it the waterfall. So it's fun to, to play with him. Yes. Because it dives down? Is that what yeah. it is? Right. He, he, he's telling you it's, it's just a joke, but it's uh, something that the hey, That's how things become reality, right? You start joking about it, the next thing you know, we're it's calling a, it the waterfall on the broadcast. And it's a great pitch. Yeah. So, and, and uh, Connor Overton uh, coming off surgery, so we're, we're going to play it a little slow with him, but... Uh, uh, ever since he's been here, he's very impressive. I've never seen him really pitch because he was always hurt uh, when I was in the Arizona League. So, uh, what I've seen from him, a uh, guy that hits spots, uh, can change speeds really well, and another guy that uh, doesn't feel intimidated being yeah. here. And good to have him back at home here in Richmond. Yeah, that's, that's got to be great for yeah. him and his family. Dish, that's all the time we have. Thanks a lot for being here today. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, here's what's coming up at the Diamond. Sam, I think starting pitchers get a bad rap. Why is that? Because people think they don't do anything when they're not pitching. That's not the case, is it? No, it's not the case. They actually do quite a lot of work. Yeah. From what I've seen, at they, least. They do something with, with these. This is like a, a, like a poster like, board. Like you do your fifth grade project. Yeah, on. it's like an Excel spreadsheet yeah. gone mad. Yeah. In fact, when starting pitchers aren't pitching, they're utilizing these. Let's take a look at how we actually fill one of these out. Look. Swing and miss, pop fly. Is that a omega sign? I don't know. The basics of the of a chart is really for the starting pitcher to kind of look over the lineup, sit behind home plate, and really see where the guy's standing on the plate, whether he's up in the box, behind the box, on the plate, off the plate, open stance, closed stance. So it's really an information gathering tool for the starting pitcher. We do it two days before um, the start. That way, the next day, he can be in the dugout with us and he can talk to the starter from the previous day and they can go over notes. It's a good way for the guys to, to really see the hitters from a different perspective. Yeah, it's always two days before you pitch. Um, I understand that I'm going to be pitching in Binghamton and I just kind of scouted for Harrisburg, but um, if you look at the schedule of playing Harrisburg again and the chances of me facing Harrisburg are pretty high, so um, I'm still kind of scouting their hitters and kind of keeping that in my back pocket. So when we play them in a couple weeks or a month or whenever it is, I can kind of bring my notes back and kind of see see how we did against them. So if we had, uh, you know, Jababi, you know, leaving off, so you'd write his name in there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and then we're just going to basically watch the game. So so first pitch was a fastball. We put a one here, and then we'd have to write the vol velocity. So say it was Ray Black pitching, so 99. All right, next pitch, fastball, but he fouls it off, so we put a circle around it. You could see that, and that one's going to be 100. All right, from Ray Black. Next, now he's going to waste a pitch, all right? So he goes ball, throws a curveball for a ball, all right? That's 87. So now you can look back and you can track the hole at bat. So now, guess what? He gets lucky. Fastball, 101. He hits a little fly ball to right field. And now you're right in here, F9. And you get one out, and then you count the number of pitches, and it's four. So this, and then this will be the location of all the pitches. So you know, say the first pitch was down and away, and the other one down and away. Curveball was, you know, hung it, breaking ball, but then guess what, he missed over the middle of the plate for the last one. Um, I personally keep a, a book by myself, and I'll transfer over my notes to that. Um, I think the coaches also like to use it um, to see where their hot zones are, where they're swinging the most for when our pitchers throw it there. I also think they use it for first pitch strikes compared to how many batters face. And they like to see what velos and what counts and just a mix of all that. I love doing the chart uh, because I can't see in or out from the dugout as a as the next day starting pitcher. So I love being in the stands so I can sit there and make my own charts on every guy and see how I was going to pitch him the next night. 
You occasionally get the kid that'll run up to you in the middle of the game and ask for an autograph, and, it, and it's not bad. And because you're generating that section with all the scouts anyway, and it's not like you're out, you know, right out in the public completely. Um, you know, you're surrounded by a bunch of, you know, grumpy-looking old guys that are, you know, charting the game, and, and they're all sitting four or five seats from each other. So there's a lot of space for you there anyway. So it's uh, it's not too bad when you're when you're up in the stands. Charting has been around, I think, forever. Um, it was back in the day before all the technology and stuff like that. The, this is how pitching coaches and organizations got their information on numbers and strike percentages and balls and strikes. I think now with iPads and cell phones, is you know they're way more advanced than they were. I think this may be one of the last years you see a pitcher in the stands with an actual physical chart. On the next episode of Flying Squirrels Insider, we'll see if the squirrels can keep dry and keep pace in a tightly contested Western Conference. And Jay takes us into the world of Con's Cuts, where pitcher Mike Connolly shows us how he keeps his teammates fresh on the road. All that and more when you join us next time on Flying Squirrels Insider. Production funding for Flying Squirrels Insider is made possible in part by... Smell gas? Act fast. Don't just stand there. Leave the area. Get out. Go where the smell is no longer present and call 911. Making you aware, keeping you safe. We're Richmond's Natural Gas Safety Awareness Program.